Hi, everyone. Welcome to the New York Symphony Orchestra's Program Noted podcast. Uh, we are so excited to be here with you today. My name is Nikki Purdy. I am the principal bass player of the New York Symphony Orchestra. I sit on the board of directors, and I am also the chair of our Education and Outreach Committee. And with us today, we have our fabulous panel of experts. We have Mr. Simeone Tartangliani, who is our music director here at the New York Symphony Orchestra. We're so lucky to have him. He is also the head of Orchestral Instruments and Conducting Division at Catholic University and the music director of the Delaware Youth Symphony Orchestra. We have Russell Murray, who is a professor of music history at University of Delaware and also the director of early music there as well. And he conducts the Chesapeake Brass Band. And last but certainly not least, we have our very own resident program notes expert, Mike Kelly, who is a professor of chemical engineering at Villanova and Widener. He has been chair at both of those places and is currently chair of that department at Widener. Um, he is also the principal French horn player of the Delaware County Orchestra. And in addition to writing our program notes for the New York Symphony Orchestra, he also writes them for the Immaculata Symphony and the Delaware County Orchestra. Thank you, gentlemen, for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have a very exciting program coming up this coming weekend. We have a couple of very fabulous young musicians joining us from our concerto competition this year. Simeone, I was wondering if you wanted to talk a little bit about what the audition process was like this year. It was a little different, of course. We couldn't have a live auditions like we always do with our panel seated there discussing and enjoying this wonderful player. So it was all done by video. Um, what struck us was we had an incredible high level with our high schoolers. We, for the first time, decided to give three honorable mention besides the two co-winners who were like execo winners. So we decided to invite them to play because it really, uh, in our history, this year was really remarkable. I, I think it's only one of the few things the pandemic did good, that is having kids at home, probably they practice much more. And so somehow the level got really to, uh, you know, a standard that we were not used anymore. So uh, we are very, very proud and very thankful to their practice, to their teachers and their parents, how they, you know, all synergetic work together to make this happen. So you will enjoy them really, really much. We have the first two today is a Samuel Kim, who is going to play the Haydn Cello Concerto First Movement, and Zoe Yost who's playing the viola with the Walter uh, Ch Viola Concerto First Movement. Wonderful yeah. talent. The other one is going to be later on in the next concert, and the winners are going to be in the fall. So we are going to update you every time. Yeah, there is much to look forward to with some exceptional performances. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Walton Concerto. So that is a work that we've actually played before in the New York Symphony Orchestra's recent history. It's a very popular concerto. Um, I want to throw it to Russell and Mike. Tell me a little bit about the history of this work. Russell, do you want to go first? Or I can go first. Yeah, no, no, go ahead, Mike. Okay, thanks. Uh, this is very interesting because there are really only two major viola concertos out there. Russell, uh, Walton's, and Hindemith. And the opening performance of the Walton was done by Paul Hindemith, who wrote his own viola concerto, which I found fantastically amazing. The Walton concerto, I believe, this is my personal belief, anybody else can argue with me if they'd like, uh, is, this is the best viola concerto ever written. Uh, I mean, it's tremendous. And for somebody to be able to play it at the high school level with the skill that's required to play those parts really surprises me. So uh, I wanted to mention that about those two things. Uh, William Walton is, this was one of his first major accomplishments. He had already written a, a bunch of music, but this one really got the attention of the entire music, the British music scene. And it really went forward well and probably started his reputation. It was written back in the twenties, I believe. And it's, at the time it was quite modern, Right now, it is very easily listened to modern. It doesn't have the dissonances that make music hard to listen to. It's all very consonant, and people are now used to those sounds. And I think it's a great piece of music. And I'm really looking forward to this one. Russell, you want to continue? Well, I was going to say, 
and this is this takes away nothing from the quality of the piece, which is wonderful. But it's just it's amazing how few pieces there are for the viola. Yes, let me say something about that one. The viola is equally virtuosic as the violin, and practically all the major composers have written their concerti for the violin. There are very few viola concertos, and only two major ones that I know of. Yeah, uh, but it belongs there. It should be played and should be heard by the public. Absolutely. Absolutely, and it should inspire more composers to write new pieces for the old orchestra. What it makes that thing unique is, uh, um, in many ways, it could be, it's close to Barber in some ways. Mm -hmm. The intensity of yeah. every single movement, every single melody, um, the contrast, the emotionally, you know, the emotional uh, ups and downs of this piece are really remarkable and always so intense and true. Really, only Barbara really comes to me close or somehow even the, the, uh, the Jetto by Mahler, it kind of, you know, fits together in many ways with this extreme intensity. It, it is weird that they start with a slow movement. Majority of concertos usually I have a, the first movement is like, you know, the bombastic one. This starts in a different way. Uh, and it's very hard to put together. And it's all did. And it's a, a concerto that has so much tempo shifting and so many details and so many intricate lines where, as Michael said, the solo cannot just play like, a, you know, a Paganini concerto where they do their job and the orchestra fits things there to make them, you know, feel good. That's a completely different story. This is really so intricate, like a Sibelius violin concerto, where the solo really need to know what the orchestra is doing, like a huge symphonic work, not just a soloist who is accompanied. So high schooler who played that well, it's kind of remarkable at that age, absolutely. Yeah, and I think, you know, as a having been in the orchestra when we played it most recently, it definitely, I could speak to the idea of not just emotion and interesting texture, interesting things to do in the solo part, but also in the orchestral parts, that it's really a, a rich and enjoyable piece to play. It almost feels like painting because there's just so many layers to it. Um, it's really quite interesting. I also want to talk about, I want to leave some time to talk about um, the Haydn concerto that we're going to hear on this coming concert. But before we jump into talking about that piece specifically, I want to spend just a couple of minutes talking about um, Haydn as a person. So colloquially in the world of music history, and even I think a little bit at the time, correct me if I'm wrong, Russell, people referred to um, Haydn as Papa Haydn because he was this big, round, happy, jovial public personality. It was one of the first kind of European rock stars. He achieved this total stardom in his own lifetime. He's interesting. I thought maybe we could break that down a little bit. I think part of it too comes from uh, the fact that he's seen as as the father of two important genres, the symphony and, and the string quartet. And I think Papa has to do with that. But um, certainly his music um, is, is always, always seems to be pleasant and even tempered and happy. <laughs> I will say as a uh, bass player, I'm a little bit bitter about the instrumentation he chose for the string quartet, which has stuck around for so long. Well, you know, that's what quintets are for, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so I also wanted to talk a little bit about this. Concerto was composed during Haydn's residency at Esterhazy as the um, Kapellmeister at that court. And I wanted to talk a little bit about what that lifestyle would have been like. Well, it was quite amazing. He, he had um, constant musical duties every day. And over the course of the week, he had to present um, a couple of concerts, a couple of operas, uh, daily um, chamber music for his employer, and a lot of the time, pieces that he wrote for his employer to play on this funny piece called the baritone, which is sort of a cross between a cello, a viola da gamba, and something of a harp. You know, it has, besides the, the strings that you normally play on a cello, it has metal strings on the back that you can pluck. And so you can accompany your melodic line with, with sort of the sounds of the harp. It's a very interesting instrument. And That's cool. You would think that that would just sour somebody, you know, to have to do that much constantly. And, you know, yes, it's Tuesday. How many quartets do you want today? But but he absolutely loved it. You know, he talked about it and he said that, that you know, he had... 
a fine orchestra in front of him every day and and he could try things out and if they didn't work then the next time he worked on something he could try something different he said the other thing was that most of the time a lot of the time was spent outside of Vienna at the summer palace at Esterhaza and rather than feeling sort of cut off he said well it was great there was no no one around to bother me and I was forced to be original and so he just he was like a kid in a candy store with this this orchestra that he could play with every day. Yeah, one of the cool things about, I'm sure all of you guys know this, but you know, if you at home listening are not a musician, one of the really fun things about playing with the same group of people is you get to know them, not just as people, but as musicians. And so Haydn is writing for an orchestra that he gets to perform with every single week. He gets to write for every single week. And when he writes this concerto, he writes it for um, Josef Franz Weigel, who was his principal cellist in his orchestra, and they were close friends. These are, you know, colleagues who had worked together for years at this point. Um, there's an interesting piece of history about the rediscovery of this concerto. It was lost for a long time, and we knew it existed because Haydn did a good job of keeping his own records. And the first couple of lines of the solo were in his catalog. And the um, concerto was not rediscovered until 1961. They found transcripts of it somewhere in a dusty library. Um, and it has subsequently become one of the most popular cello concertos, especially the 20th century. I just have to put a plug in of hope that they will find also his lost bass concerto, which is also in that same catalog and has just been gone. Much like uh, Mike was saying, there's not very many concertos for the bass either. And I'd love to have the Haydn concerto. Um, Mike, what would you say, if we were going to write program notes about the first Haydn cello concerto, what would you say? I would probably echo much of what you just said. Uh, he was possibly the best musician of his time in terms of popularity. He might or might not have been best in terms of what he actually did, but uh, his popularity was uh, incredible. Uh, so, uh, but what you said as being a string artist rather than a brass musician like I am, you know all this stuff a lot better than I do, but uh, I think that describes what he's done quite well. I, I listened to that work once in my life, I believe. I liked it a lot, but I'm, as I said, a brass musician. I tend to look for more modern things than that, but it was very well done. It's, I don't think it's incredibly virtuosic, but it's certainly virtuosic, and the solo part fits in well with the rest of the music, so. Mm -hmm. And in many ways, uh, this concerto very often is performed in the competitions, auditions, so I, I've heard many times. Oh, okay. What is hard is playing the tune. All the double stop stops. All this, you know, this is music like Mozart. This you cannot. There's nothing to cover you. Either yeah. it's in tune and clean, or it's out of tune and dirty. And then if it's dirty, forget it. We don't want to hear it. So uh, again, a merit to our Samuel. He played that in tune. All the double stops. I remember when I was listening. I say. Wow, yeah, it was really, you know, how many, how many, they're all in tune. So that, that kind of difficulty is actually quite remarkable. It may not be as virtuoso as the Vardjak with a lot of double stops and things, but to be clean and musical, it's really a challenge in this piece. So um, again, good job, Samuel. Yeah, we are excited to hear that piece. Um, we also are going to feature a little bit of Mozart on this program. And there was actually quite a special relationship between Haydn and Mozart. Anybody want to take that one? Well, Mozart, uh, Haydn greatly um, admired Mozart's gift. Um, I, there was one incident where he heard uh, Mozart play one of his pieces. And uh, he went up to Mozart's father and, and basically said, I can tell you before God and everybody, I've never heard a musician the level of your son um, and he says and what's more he has taste <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was a two-way street uh, Mozart admired Haydn greatly and and one of his sets of quartets the so-called Haydn quartets were written and dedicated um, to Haydn yeah it's it's they lived at the same time did Mozart actually study with Haydn or was it just that they were good friends they they were uh, they were colleagues. Interesting. So Haydn 
is born before Mozart, and I correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe dies after Mozart. Haydn lives a nice long life, and Mozart lives a short one. Yes. And of course, <laughs> you know, at that time, you didn't need really necessary to just study with one person. Right. The output of Haydn and the progression of Haydn symphonic experiments, uh, symphonic work, symphonic construction, the sonata form that he was trying to, you know, build and change it. You know, he transferred to Mozart inevitably. And Mozart was the same also with Bach. Once he saw, you know, some of the polyphonic incredible, you know, genius things that Bach did with the with contrapoint, you can see right away in Mozart uh, works. So um, studying there was a little different. Just listening or watching a score inspired a genius like Mozart, so like, you know, on the spot. Yeah, it's, uh, Mozart was, a once in a generation kind of brilliant musician mind. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the history of this symphony. It was written in uh, 1782, it was finished in 82, for the ennoblement of Sigmund Hafner the Younger, whose father was the mayor of Salzburg. And Mozart is from Salzburg. I love Salzburg. It's a beautiful city. I, I like to say that I would have written music like Mozart if I had lived in Salzburg too my whole life, but I don't know how true that is. Um, <laughs> Give it a try. Not yeah. Um, it was not adapted until a symphony. It was not adapted into a symphony until after its original use. It was written as a suite for um, that ceremony. Anybody have anything you want to add on Mozart? I feel like we haven't even scratched the surface. Uh, I, I can talk probably about the orchestra difficulty and difference in playing a, a Mozart or Haydn piece compared to a Walter or Tchaikovsky symphony. Um, the amount of listening that a symphony like Hafer needs to have is different from anything else in other composer I just mentioned. Um, like we said about the cello concerto in Haydn, there is a very fine line between being in the right place or horrible. You know, there is a, in, in some bigger symphony, like a Tchaikovsky symphony or Shostakovich, there is more latitude and more elements that can still give the right picture. In a symphony like Hafner or any of Mozart, there is a very fine line that is, you know, doesn't give you much, you know, uh, freedom of being out from being perfect. So in this it is really a tribute to our players who did a spectacular job. And Hafner in particular is a virtuoso symphony. There's a lot of fast and famous orchestra excerpts that we take from there when we want to hire people for a job. So the, the orchestra, and it's like the presto at the end, the, the first movement, they are all really fast and really remarkable. There is one thing that I, I want to add that changed our view of this symphonies. That is, uh, once we were aware of uh, Hummel and Czerny arrangement of Mozart symphonies, and some of the Heisen, I believe, too, they put metronome markings. And if you look how the symphonies were done by, I don't know, the time of Furt Wengler, Kara, Jan Böhm, at that, that, that time, the tempi were really different. And especially two were the main differences. The slow adagios, and the minuet. The metro markings that we find in Czerny and Hummel, and Hummel no more, new Mozart, he heard them play, their metro markings are much faster. So in that way, I tried a little bit to push things forward so the orchestra could get a sense of what maybe is more what Mozart intended. Of course, who knows, okay? We all are guilty to put our taste there, but I tried. Yeah, I remember you pushing the tempo on the finale of that symphony, um, <laughs> which is all, entirely a bass audition excerpt. Uh, we also have one more, I believe one more piece on this program, and I want to throw it to Mike. Tell us a little bit about the Mahler. Uh, I'll start off by saying is one of the things that I saw as a citation out there is that this is the most frequently played piece of music that Mahler ever wrote. And I thought, that cannot possibly be. But then I started thinking about it. This is the fourth movement of a symphony. He was a symphonist, and this is one of his most popular symphonies. So every time that symphony is played, this gets played. 
but it also gets played an awful lot as a filler piece, something to fill out a program that they need something smaller, not going to do a whole large Mahler symphony. Can't do that without the whole program, probably. But and so that's why it probably is the most frequently played bit of music that Mahler ever wrote. Now, the second thing I would like to say has absolutely nothing to do with that, where it came from. Mahler composed this symphony and finished it in 1902. In late in that year, 1902, he married Alma Schindler, one of the vocalists and players that he had conducted as a conductor. And uh, he then became Alma Maria Mahler. But when he was writing this, he had to have been back and forth with her much of the time with giving her an, an idea of what was going on. And the Adagio Adagietto was specifically written for her. He wrote it, and when he sent it to her to show it to her, he wrote a poem to go with it that was essentially a love poem. Now, it's hard in these days to think of a love song as being part of a symphony, but that's essentially what this movement was. So uh, that's my small bit of background on uh, Mahler and Alma. And the work wasn't even performed for about two more years after he wrote it. Uh, he was in the midst of coming back from a major serious injury that almost cost him his life. While, and he wrote it while he was coming back from it to get these movements done. And they were married before he finished the movement, but he had already finished the Adagietto at that point. He just had to finish up the last finale and rescore and things of that sort. So this is probably Mahler's most significantly or most frequently played piece of music. Interesting. I, I would add to that, and that's a little personal to me. Another reason I think why it's famous is because of Franco Mannino, who was a, a very famous Italian composer, conductor, pianist. He was really a spectacular person. Um, he was the one who always made the music of Luchino Visconti movies. No. And one of Luchino Visconti famous movie, Dead in Venice, Franco Manino wrote the music, but then he said, I couldn't do anything, but I really, I needed that piece by Mahler. Because <laughs> he said they really expressed it. So he became super, I think, even more famous because of that, at least in Italy. Okay, yeah, I don't know I in America realize how it much. In the movie. Yeah, I don't know how much Dead in Venice is famous in Italy. Of course, Luchino you know, Visconti. And I, I know that because I was close to Franco Manino with Alessandro, my wife, the last three years of his life in Rome. We were very close to him and uh, I even arranged the, the music for his funeral when he died. So I, I remember firsthand that he's, a, he's a law for this piece and even he composed like Opus 670. You know, he, he wrote like an enormous amount. In that movie he said, I couldn't write anything. I needed the model at a jet. So that was a little story about that that I knew. That fits perfectly with what I heard about this, uh, the origin of the work. Fantastic. I think it's going to be a really great program. Um, I'm excited to see this concert myself. Anybody have anything else you want to throw into this conversation? All right, then I will bring this to a close. I just want to say thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you for listening to our podcast. And thank you for supporting our orchestra. Just by watching this, you have supported the orchestra. Please consider liking it, commenting on it, sharing it with your friends and family. And if you have the means to do so right now, we know that times are tight. But please consider donating to financially support our orchestra. We operate almost entirely off of donor contributions this season because we're not charging anything for our concert tickets. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. Be well, be healthy, and enjoy the program.